very important uh, topic that is AI. I mean, uh, I was just talking to uh, my molecular pathologist and she said, you know, we will use AI in this and AI in this and AI in this. And everywhere the AI seems to be, component seems to be there. But very few people actually know what AI is. And how will it really, you know, a lot of companies will come and say, we will use AI and we will use uh, stuff like that. I totally believe AI is uh, going to be there in medical oncology. It is almost like uh, a liquid biopsies, whether you like it or hate it, you can't ignore it. AIs will be there. So to speak more about uh, AIs in uh, lung cancer, AIs in cancer, and the topic is uh, embrace AI before it's too late. Can I invite Dr. Parvesh Parikh? who does not need any introduction and uh, it's, it's very nice actually that you know Parikh sir at this uh, uh, time and stature, I don't want to say the age, is actually going to teach us about AI. So welcome sir, stage is all yours. So AI makes uh, time and stature and age irrelevant, right? So let me begin by asking all of you, how many of you have come here into this room with your computer? Please raise your hand. So, exactly, that was my point that the, everybody should have raised the hand and rightly so many of you did raise. So as far as the, this uh, <coughs> carriage with the horse and the horseless carriage is concerned, let's start with a little fun and this is the what is happening with our cars, right? Sentil said, uh, not Sentil, Ulla said that I am going to talk about oncology, but I am not going to talk about oncology at all. So the top left hand side is a photograph from Delhi and then people start leaving the steering wheel and then finally there is no steering wheel at all. Right, so this is the driverless car that you talk about in the United States. How many of you know that this driverless car is also available in India? Raise your hands. <coughs> so at least one person is up to date. The smartphone that is in your pocket has been used by an Indian to make a driverless car. Okay. That is the power of the computer that you have in your pocket. Those who remember Carl Sagan and the pale blue dot that is the Voyager took that photograph and Voyager was the first human satellite to leave our solar system. The computer on that Voyager was 10% of the computer that you have in your pocket right now. <coughs> so why do driverless cars work? Okay, they work not because it's just one car as we know and then it is moving around the way it wants to but it has several sophisticated sensors and GPS, etc., etc. <coughs> so sophisticated technology and artificial intelligence power, so what could go wrong? And assuming the same thing, <coughs> now people are driving the Tesla while wearing a virtual reality camera or uh, headphones. And obviously if something like that happens, you know the consequences, right? So there have been umpteen number of accidents that driverless car have had in United States, especially in California where it is very advanced. And the US watchdog is watching this, what happens with the Tesla crash. <coughs> and finally, the judgment from the court says that Tesla was not responsible. Okay. So this is the problem of artificial intelligence and technology that we have today. We take robotic surgery for granted. How many of you know that there are more than 100 patients who have died on the table because of malfunction of that robotic surgery? And Da Vinci has $65 million earmarked for settling all those claims. Okay, so that is what is going to be our future problems. And Ullas mentioned about what is, everybody talks about artificial intelligence and what it really means. <coughs> so I would like to divide that into three parts. So most of it that you and I talk about is machine learning, that is the stage one of artificial intelligence. And then we have to artificial general intelligence where actually the machine has the intelligence to do things. 
and finally the ultimate which i hope doesn't exist already is the machine consciousness or artificial super intelligence so the first example of how artificial intelligence works and machine learning works was may 11 1997 when the deep blue computer won against the world champion in chess and this is very um, uh, logical to understand because in chess everything is rules based so it can be easily translated into zeros and one that the computer understands the next landmark the next change that occurred was 10 years later in 2017 when artificial intelligence won at a game of poker so why is the difference the difference is that besides the logical rules of the game in poker you have to start bluffing and now the computer knows how to bluff and that's why the computer won 1 1.7 million us dollars over 20 days in this competition now all of us use something like uber right and this is 2 uh, days ago when i was going to amdavar airport you can see from the top left hand side how the car is moving forwards and you can trace it now you will say what is so great in this so the important thing is that all this happened while my location was off in google maps and in uber so irrespective of whether your phone location is on or off they are now able to track you so earlier you thought that while you are doing a, a google chrome or you are using an incognito mode people will not be able to know what you are doing please forget that that is long gone out <coughs> in fact the artificial intelligence allows uber to charge you based on the percentage of battery of your phone okay so this is an example that happened in brussels the one of the journalists and the brussels time did this he used two iphone simultaneously from his office saying he wanted to go to the city center in one phone the battery was 84% and in the other it is 12% and look at the difference in the charge that was shown on the uber for while booking the time so that same thing is also happening in india <coughs> the most of us have used chat gpt at some time or the other right please raise your hand those who have used awesome awesome and it becomes very very obvious when you get a message that was written by chat gpt or gpt4 because it's impeccable english and grammar and so polite oh my god <laughs> so when somebody send me a mail uh, i could immediately recognize that and the advantage of that is now patients are getting happier and more satisfied if you are using artificial intelligence or the language that you you have access to now dr raja is here and i am taking the example from his actual practice okay he had a rich patient a relapsed net and this was after proton therapy and he was coming for second opinion and he asked dr raja for a letter of recommendation so that he could go abroad and ask for the opinion okay and all of you know that this is the sort of complicated thing that happens in a relapsed pnet now i am assuming that dr raja did that he went to chat gpt and asked these questions what are the treatment options is carbon beam therapy a good option and what are the pros and cons based on that he wrote the description of the patient and gave a reference letter and when this patient went to heidelberg and united states they contacted dr raja back to say that oh my god you know everything that we know as an expert in this field so we have to make use of this we have to make use of this sort of information and help our patients <coughs> this is a real case now let's move on to the ma- mind body nexus and the human body and you must have all heard of the neural chip right that elon musk keeps talking about 
these are some of the photographs it's so tiny it's like a penny and it can be installed using robotics into your brain now this is the let me see if i can play the video you can see pager is amazingly good at mind pong he's focused and he's playing entirely of his own volition one of the things the neuralinks allow pager to do is to play his favorite video game pong to control his paddle on the right side of the screen, Pager simply thinks about moving his hand up or down. We've removed the joystick altogether. Now that he's up to speed, let's increase the difficulty and see how well Pager can play with the Neuralink. We can interact. As you can see, Pager is a ma- So he was probably playing faster than I was playing. And on 29 January 2024, a few days ago, the first human patient had already got an implant of this neural link. So this is how fast things are moving. So now what is the difference between machine learning and deep learning? I think this is very important for us to understand. On the top side is machine learning, <coughs> where whatever is the input first, it is extracted by a human being and then it gets classified by the computer to give an output. If you totally remove the human being, that means you don't have the training set and you don't have a validation set, you straight go and tell the computer, you do whatever you want and you find out what is happening. That is deep learning. And you might have heard that Google Bard recently learned Bengal, Bengali on its own. There was no command given to it to start learning a new language. Still, it learned something on its own. So it can initiate an action and complete the action to its logical conclusion, and that is deep learning. And so many of you will know what is chat GPT. Some of you may also know what is Gemini. So all those who know Gemini, please raise your hand. I'm glad that there are a few of them. Gemini is a, is a new name for something that already existed, from Google's stables. And this is the difference between the operations of chat GPT on the left hand side, 86.4% and Gemini, which is 90%. So what is the biggest difference? In chat GPT, you have to text, you have to type something, you have to type a sentence, you have to give a text. As far as Gemini is concerned, you can input anything, including an image. So in the top side, there's two balls of wool, one is pink and one is uh, uh, blue and you can ask them to indicate, Jaimina to indicate what can be done out of this and then it will show you how would an octopus with blue and pink tentacles or you can show a mu piece of music with a foreign language and it will translate into that and tell you that this particular piece is to be played slowly on a piano. Now this is the sort of thing that is happening. And for today's uh, lecture, I put an old photograph of mine. Sorry. A physical OBT O me aapka swagat. A feminine sort of voice speaking in English, and anybody's photograph is possible to do that. Now, to understand better about this, let's look at Dal E, and the third version is available today. Today, to produce an image, it has 12 million parameters. Whereas the images that it has is only 1 million images. So there are more parameters than the data available. And this is the sort of quantum training data that is available to artificial intelligence today. Now, what if somebody wants to play the, you know, do something different from what it's supposed to do? So these people had a software that was used to identify new drugs. And the way to identify new drugs is to say that there is good efficacy and less toxicity. So they decided, let us see if we can turn the switch. Zero is converted into one. So instead of looking at safe drugs, let us see if we can find really toxic drugs that can be used as a poison. And overnight, in less than 24 hours, the computer system came up with 40,000 toxins. 
many of these toxins were chemicals which had never been seen before. So the conclusion of the authors were, oh my God, we have opened a Pandora's box. And this is not a joke, this has actually been published in Nature Machine Intelligence. Dual use of artificial intelligence powered drug discovery. So far, we have seen machine learning system developed for Netflix, online advertising, self-driven cars. But now, we are having machine learning systems for biology. And there was a conference organized in France that happened earlier uh, this year. So, deep mind artificial intelligence has discovered the structure of nearly every protein known to science. The first protein structure identified was when I was born, that is in the year 1958. By the year 2020, humans had identified 1,77,000 structures of various proteins. And then in the next two years, this alpha fold program and the deep mind group of scientists released it publicly in July 21 and by July 22, the protein structure of 200 million proteins was identified by artificial intelligence. Now, this is the level of difference that is happening between human mind and artificial intelligence. So, if you look at colorectal cancer, artificial intelligence can allow or assist colonoscopic screening. And the idea is to improve the adenoma detection rate by artificial intelligence. And this is a program called GI Genius, which increases the detection rate by 14%. And how does it do that? It does that by focusing the attention of the operator on specific areas of interest. Striving for cleaning, striving for navigating, so the, striving for detecting. And on the so right, the green know, rectangles the are the areas box. which are suspicious it's and therefore the attention is focused on that. Big green and it collects 250 images per second. So if there are 250 images per second collected and you have to have the feedback from artificial intelligence in real time basis, then the regular internet is not able to do that. So for this uh, company called Odin Vision, they are using a satellite to connect to the server and bounce back to you. So by the time you complete your endoscopic screening, you will also already have the feedback. And that is the sort of speed that is required. And this is the meta-analysis of all the randomized clinical trials that were used for assisted endoscopic clearance. And you can see that there was an overall 47% increase in the detection of cancer. 14% increase in the detection of adenomas and 47% increase in the detection of cancer. And the forest plot shows that everything is in favor of artificial intelligence. It can also predict response to chemotherapy in colorectal cancer and this is data on 1000 patients. And how it does is not by looking at the tumor cells but by looking at the stroma. So using deep learning, the computer has identified a cutoff based on stroma high and stroma low tumors. And this is the survival that you can see for the difference. It is stroma high tumors have a poor survival. Artificial intelligence can also help reduce unnecessary additional surgery. 15.1% reduction in need for additional surgery based on current guidelines. There is also an ability to personalize predictive survival among colorectal patients. And this was data on 1,236 patients using a 118 parameter yes, no binary predictive value. Now we are moving on to microbiome based colorectal cancer classification. So classification gets to be complicated more and more. And this is based on electronic nose. So what is this electronic nose? It is the volatile organic compounds that are extruded 
and that are exhaled by us, that can identify what sort of colorectal cancer you have. And you might think that all of this is happening outside India, nothing is happening in India. So if you look at colorectal cancer and artificial intelligence on PubMed, there are 50 publications from our country as well. Now if you go to the single cell, there are lots, many limitations of biology as far as artificial intelligence is concerned. The most important is tissue is still the issue. One single cell you can't process for NGS as well as for histopathology and artificial intelligence. And if you use certain staining like DAPI, then obviously further test is not possible. So for that, this publication, actually it's not a publication, it's a preprint. It is still to undergo peer review, so that is the disclaimer in this. But this says that adesome receptor clustering is accompanied by co-localization co of associated genes in the cell nucleus. Now here, I would like to you to focus only on this. So this is the metastatic, this is cancerous, this is fibrocytic and this is normal cells. Okay, it is divided into these four groups. And then the computer is identifying what sort of image it will produce. And again, if you concentrate here, this is actually processing of the histopathological tissue and this is what was predicted by the artificial intelligence. And at least to my naked eye, this looks like it is correlating exceedingly well. So what does it do? It looks at the structure of the cell, okay, only the structure of the cell. So this is a normal cell when there are ablation of actin related genes, the cell becomes a sphere. When there are ablation of microtubule related genes, the cell becomes flattened. And when there is ablation of nuclear structure proteins, it becomes an irregular sphere with indentation. So what is there in the DNA, what is there in the protein, what, how the cell is functioning can be predicted based on the change in the structure. And this is what is shown here that this will give what sort of gene expression already exists. So here is the big picture, everything is here. This is the NGS, DNA and gene expression. This is the normal histology and immunohistochemistry. And now in addition to that, we have to check how adjacent the cells are to each other. And if you put these three things together, then this is what you get. So this is how the computer deep learning encodes it. It looks at the latent spaces and then it decodes it. And what you get here and what you get here is exactly identical. So this is the power of how we are now talking about more labs and more NGS samples. We are already in a realm where NGS will no longer be necessary because it is the cell three dimensional structure. And I think Govind has done a lot of work on that with Triesta at one time in Bangalore on a three-dimensional structure and how it works. The last part of my talk is on cancer symptom monitoring and how it can help us. So this requires natural language processing, okay? Patients are going to complain about something which is not in the medical terminology. It is based on uh, the whatever language they know. But it is still possible and this is the program ML Sim which has a deep natural learning processing, which can then identify what is happening. And you can see that here it identifies an 11% risk of unplanned acute care. So you can identify from the chatter or the conversation that the patient is having that this patient might need an early intervention even when the patient is at home. Now, one of the person who I consider as my guru for artificial intelligence is David Shapiro. And if you want to interact with him, you have to get into uh, GitHub. So this is how you can go and register yourself in GitHub and then announce to the community what is your interest. And then you can start, you know, cooperating, collaborating and working on projects together, everything in the ethernet so that you can contribute and co uh, collaborate with everybody. 
And if you do that, once you are registered, you can download this version 1.0.3 of the clinical rejects and then start looking at how patient feedback and patient chatter about side effects can help you identify patients who are at high risk for acute care. Finally, I would like to add that robots have also become a reality. This robot is a CEO of a Polish wine company and not to be outdone. ISRO is already uh, ready to launch an Indian female robot called Vyomitra. So this is a cartoon that all of you know, right? Pills and surgery, everybody is interested. Lifestyle changes, nobody is interested. So also is it for artificial intelligence. People are interested in commercial reuse, but not interested in regulations. And this is the proof of that. So when the European Union said that we wanted stricter norms for use of artificial intelligence, Southeast Asian countries said that business friendly approach is more important. So ladies and gentlemen, there are more than seven ways in which artificial intelligence will change the healthcare industry as we know it. And this is going to happen in 2024, not sometime in the future. And we can interact and discuss more about this. Thank you very much. Yes, Amol. So thanks for the very interesting talk. I just wanted to ask, is there any studies or do you think in future, the most important thing that probably everybody in this hall wants to know about themselves is time of death. So can AI predict death? No, most, I said most, not all. Is it, is it possible? What is your thoughts on that? I, I don't know about that, but we have the alert and basically uh, 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 AI ML ML model. In which we took 4,500 people of lung cancer. We took the PET images, we took the histopathological scans, and we predicted whether somebody will get a biomarker or not. Okay. Our initial uh, uh, positivity rate or the concordance rate was 83%. Then we got a teaching curve as the ML goes. This year with 91%. Great. Now the next one which we are doing, this was the thing which I got the uh, Innovation Grant Award from the ACR. The next one which we are doing is whether somebody will detect brain mets, whether somebody will detect, I mean now we are, I was just talking in the car, we are going, to, we have analyzed data of I think 1000, 2000 people of NGS lung cancer. People who got, there are some people who have got a comparable uh, mutation that baseline at, at this thing. So whether AI can predict the overall survival oh, and resistance mutation, that is the next project which we have written. Hopefully in two months time I will let you know the answer. Then gradually you will come to the healthy people. Yes. <laughs> Not my death, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I will tell you. I will <laughs> so uh, to answer your question, Amol, $760 million have been earmarked by Google for a team that is looking at a cure for death of human beings. So they don't think that death is a natural process, it's a disease and we need to cure it. So maybe you are right, in the future we might have that. Parvish Pai, so what is the recent announce by, announcement by you know, Mr. Elon Musk that um, they have already started their Neuralink connect with um, and then he is proposing that elderly persons are already on trial and their uh, neurological alertness and competence can be improved, which has already been shown. All right. We are already there, almost there, I think. So, so uh, uh, neural chip insertion is nothing that is uh, new. It has been there for 50 years. And there are at least three other companies who are ahead of Elon Musk, but their focus is on physical limitation overcoming. So if the person has a paralysis, how to solve that? If the person has a you know, paraplegia, how to solve that. If a person is in wheelchair, then how to solve that. This is the first time and he is talking about telepathy. And telepathy means that you think of something and you can, action will automatically happen. So that is the crucial thing. US FDA had a lot of concern about how the chip would be inserted and in case it, there is a need, how will it be removed? And therefore, between 2016 and 2021, the US FDA did not give uh, Elon Musk the approval to get into human trials. They had to do things in monkeys and pigs, and afterwards, ultimately, they got the permission to do that. 
and like you mentioned on 29 january the first patient had that insertion and the press really said that it is functioning well and it has interface with the computer thank you very much